Whiskers is asking, what are some of the biggest lessons learned on working on Ether One? Use source control. Oh, oh my god! Wow, yeah. <laughs> now, who's got who's got the hard drive? I think oh. Pete's got it. Where's Pete? Oh, he's on holiday. <laughs> so the latest version of the game, what was being worked on and what was up to date would be on a like a pen drive. And there was a place that we put the pen drive, but sometimes someone would go home and the pen drive would be in their pocket and then they weren't in for two days or something. And yeah. Did you have a backup pen drive? It just would have mattered no. if by then you'd, someone would have already worked on something. We used to use Skype and we'd send we things on Skype. <laughs> really? yeah. Skype was our Slack slash Discord. I mean, did Slack. anything else exist like that then? No. no. I mean, MSN, I guess, but. Yeah. How new we were when we started the project. Like Ether One was our huge lesson into developing and building. And for me, it was like building modular sets, lighting, and building the world. Like who I was as an as an artist at the end of this project from the beginning was like a completely oh, yeah. different person. So I think the whole journey of the game was discovering and making so many mistakes uh, all along the way. How many times did you rebuild the harbor? Five times, uh, I think. Yeah. Oh, come on, wasn't it more like fourteen? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. It was a lot. It yeah. Was a lot. kind of did it remotely and back then remotely wasn't anywhere near as accessible as it is now. There were quite a few sessions as well where we went to Pete's flat um, to look at the, the development on the game and at that point there wasn't really a game it was art tests and all of that kind of stuff but we, we still knew that it was important for us all to be together to make it feel like a team. I didn't think I was going to do very well if I had to work from home so I tried to set myself up in some form of office space and uh, actually the, the space I'm sitting in right now maybe here on this seat next to me is where I would have started where uh, this was my uncle and auntie's office they, they said they had a bit of space if I wanted to sit down and bring a computer and do some work and I was doing some work over Skype with them um, and while we were here I think Isabel and David at some point proposed that if we wanted to rent the space and we were talking about getting a studio or some place that we could all work together to work on the project and make it more serious. For me that's when the game really started to take, to take shape, it's when we were able to collaborate together and it was really like nostalgic looking back on that time, we were all, all over, over each other in here and uh, it got really hot in the summer, freezing cold in the winter. When Dave came into the studio, that was pretty fun because he's just a, he's such a fun guy. He just says random things and just makes you laugh. The dynamic was just great. I think coming in here, you just you get a bit closer as a team. NJ would be at lunchtime just playing random guitar songs and, and then cheering everyone up. Dave would be talking about splitting muffins, which was a funny thing. We used to have a board on the wall that we just have Dave's quotes of the week, where he'd just say something random that would just catch everyone and make us laugh. I had the habit of deleting music anyway. I think Dave on day one like came down and sat next to me and he said, oh, that sounds exactly like, <laughs> like I just finished a piece that I really liked and I was like, <sighs> and I didn't see it, but I was like, yeah, if he thinks that it's got to go. Just went, no, that's not, no, I can't, I can't have my music just sound like Skyrim to you. Uh, he wasn't happy. And so I didn't, I didn't make the best first impression with him. And then there was another piece that I really liked and it's like, if you listen really carefully, that sounds a little bit like Mario. And I was like, what am I delete? Like just get rid of the whole lot. So yeah, I did have a habit of deleting music. We were all just like ducked around on computers, but it was quite a nice camaraderie as well. Like you just had everybody like self-contained, getting on with their own little bits of the game. We were in this space, it looks different now, but like we were here and, and started working together and it was, it was just all really naive, I think. It was just sort of like, yeah, I think we could do this, yeah, cool. Um, I don't think any of us, I think we, we knew that it was gonna be hard, but I don't think we knew what we were getting into. story be. Here at White Paper Games, we always value our friends and loyal followers, so it's with all our hearts and all our hopes that we'd like to say a big thank you. What's that up, guys? We didn't have our own internet connection. We couldn't afford broadband as a team. So 
we were using upstairs is broadband their connection with a home plug if anyone's a, a game developer in the stream you'll know that uh, uploading builds to steam can be a bit finicky sometimes it can drop out if the tunnel's not great so no matter how much we tried we couldn't upload the build from this this room because steam just kept dropping out because it was over the home plug so me and james on the day of release i mean dave was finishing the build on the morning of release anyway but then me and James basically had to unplug our computer, go and sit upstairs in their corridor where the router was and manually upload the game, just sat on the floor. How's it going, Pete? Good job. <laughs> We just click and upload and that's it. <laughs> we just wait. Yep. And this is just the steam in it. Yeah. Is that all you see? Yep. That's so weird. It's quite faster than it has been. Success. Yay! Uploaded! Uploaded! And that's where we sent all the press, all the press emails from as well. So just all the press that we're receiving builds. Uh, we essentially did that on the day of release, which I'm not sure why we did that. I guess the game wasn't ready until the day of release. Definitely so not. Send the, press out. the height of the development of Ether One, I think we had probably seven people maybe eight at one point working in the room. <clears throat> I think the core team was six of us, um, but other people who worked on the game, I think there were about, you know, about maybe seven of us, maybe eight of us working in the room. Now the studio is way bigger because we've expanded into a studio, an art studio from behind, and there was a, a cafe through there, so we've taken over the whole space. We were really fortunate to get a studio space. I think nowadays it's not something that a lot of independent developers would have taken so early on in their, their kind of career. The challenges were um, space at the time, you know, um, we're really kind of creative individuals. It's not just all tech, head down, you know, communicating, drawing, kind of like illustrating what we kind of wanted to achieve, you know. A lot of analogue, um, I think that, that kind of identity has continued in white paper games. Uh, it kind of work all the way through is like a, that connecting analogue with digital kind of work. It felt like a, like a home, you know, like we had a space to kind of work and started building out, building out the game from there. Um, but obviously being in the same space allowed for lots of rapid communication and lots of, you know, lots of kind of challenges of like, well, where are we going to go? What, what are we trying to, you know, kind of achieve here? The game was about memory for a very long time. And I think personal experiences that were happening in our lives kind of started to be drawn into that journey, which is kind of where the topic of kind of dementia and other kind of key themes in the game started like really kind of coming through in what we were kind of building. When was the last time you played the game, NJ? Yeah. So, we had looked at the redo version. That's strange. But this version, God knows, and I like, actually played it, played it, mm. like, actually, as a player, yeah. seven years ago, maybe. And you remember most of it. Remember exactly the whole of the level. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not necessarily the interactions, but the layout of everything, yeah, I know the whole thing. Everyone sacrificed so much. It wasn't just a personal sacrifice, it was the whole team making sacrifice. Yeah, there were, there were definitely really challenging times making the game. I mean, we made it on a very small budget and we bootstrapped the whole project. Looking back now, I, could, you don't really, I don't see the hard times as much. I just see the perseverance we all had in just getting the game over the line and sticking together was, was what really um, stands out to me now. But yeah, there were, there were challenging times. There was a conflict at times, but it was it was all because we were so passionate about what we were trying to produce. I had never ever in my life done an effect before going into white paper games and then the guys were like, oh we want to make this ribbon that has flowing ink into the into the world and we were all like, well how are we going to do that? And I guess I just went like, well I'll try. And that's that, that was all it was. It wasn't even flexibility, it was just like, well, I could try. and. 
you know, it worked out a few times. <laughs> Others it didn't. <laughs> a few times it worked and I made a job out of it, so I don't know. <laughs> Definitely put everything of me into Ether One and and learn a lot along the way about building environments. It was definitely a big lesson in level composition and lighting and how to create a certain mood and tone throughout a game. Uh, the colour theory you choose when you're lighting a scene um, to depict a certain mood or a vibe is something that Ether One definitely gave me like a, a blueprint to work with. This is uh, the biggest level of the game by far, isn't it? It's huge. The lighting in here is really cool. Like, did we... Is this um, faked? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean by fake? Beams are fake. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the oh, volumetric. Yeah, it's not volumetric <laughs> scattering. <laughs> it's, uh... yeah. Volumetric fog wasn't a thing. I have a stupid question. How come the UDK version is so different from the Unreal version? Because it's two different game engines. Okay. okay. So it's like Unreal Engine 3, which again, we spent like five years just really polishing that. And then the Unreal 4 version, was we knew what the game was, but it was also just a completely different engine, so everything just felt a little bit different. Like Dave was saying this morning, like on the extractions, the way Unreal handled movement, like player movement, is just a complete. It might as well be Unity versus Unreal at that point, because they just changed how the movement code worked as well, didn't they, Dave? So yeah, and I think the other problem that we faced with that was like we had it was a few months to get it up and running with UE4. There was a few months to get it up and running on the PlayStation 4, but then also we were on a deadline because we had a slot How do I play that? We were on a PlayStation Plus, and we had to make that deadline, right? right? Otherwise, it would have the deal would have fallen through, and that would have been really, really bad. Oh, I can't even connect this team. Is he? Ah, he should be fixing Ether. Dave, fix Ether. Stop playing it. Hmm. Before I joined, they didn't have a programmer, so I was the programmer, but also I was a fresh graduate out of uni programmer, so like, I hadn't really chipped anything of my own before. It's testament to the whole team that everybody just sort of like, dug deep and found what it took to ship that game, because there were so many things that none of us had ever done. Things like optimization as well, which, you know, as artists, if you're just making portfolio pieces or even just levels and scenes, like, if they're not going into a final shipped product, then you know you don't have to necessarily think about certain things. And then all of a sudden, all we you know we think about optimization, we think about batching things. Pete would prototype something, and then the whole team would like sort of play it and go back and forth on it. And then, when necessary, I would take those systems and like lower them down to code and make them a bit more solidified. There were a couple of like experimental mechanics. So the lamp, the like iconic ether lamp, already existed at this point but it was used more as like a central puzzle, puzzle token. So the idea would be you would move the lamp from environment to environment, place it into the ground, it would twist in, lock in, and then you know it would unlock some part of the environment or some other part of the puzzles. And then because all that stuff sort of already existed, they were starting to lean more towards a puzzle game at that point. So we started exploring a little bit more down that route, but being a bit more flexible and freeform. So the way it often worked would be maybe like Pete and NJ between them would like, maybe Pete would take the lead on the puzzles and then NJ would offer some additional design input and like between them they would sort of coalesce into a good puzzle. And then where it was necessary, like I would like code up some of the functionality for it. Um, but Pete would usually have a go in Kismet first, which is the visual scripting system. And then if necessary, I would then sort of lower that back down to what was at the time Unreal Script, which was like a weird java -y, language um, specifically for Unreal Development Kit and Unreal Engine 3. There were often a few bits and bobs where like we really struggled because UDK was like a locked down binary. It's not like today. Today with like Unreal Engine 4 and Unreal Engine 5, if you have something that you want to change about the engine, you can because the source is there. It might take some doing depending on what you want to do, but like where there's a will, there's a way. With UDK, because it was closed binary and we only had access to Unreal Script and Kismet, if there was something that you couldn't do in Kismet, you had to do it in Unreal Script. And if it was something that you couldn't do in Unreal Script, you couldn't do it basically near enough full stop. But that led to us being quite creative what we could do. And I think there were also a few challenges visually with things like the lamp. So getting the shadows and the physics and movement of the lamp to like look and play nicely was quite a challenge. Like we spent a lot of time on that. This was the first thing you coded on Ether One, isn't it? Yeah, I rewrote this like five times yeah. though. Oh my god. It's just, I think it's just a sine wave or something in the air, or a cos cosine 
that just takes a little bit of movement momentum and accumulates it because we tr we had physics on it with a physics asset and it was just horrendous it yeah. would literally just go like all over the place it was ridiculous <laughs> what are they doing it <laughs> now I remember that if I don't do this right <laughs> it locks yeah this is a no going back puzzle it will just completely lock if you don't get it right it's what, um, for the rest of the game. Yeah. I know which one Dude, it is. Why? To get the, to it's get the, the third row down, and you turn all of them on. Requires three valves, at eighteen units. Or you start the game again. That seems like a you thing to do, Josh. I think uh, on one of the walkthroughs online, it's like at this point, make a backup of your save. <laughs> this is the Dark Souls of puzzles. This is. Fifth, ten, five, three. Third row down. Where's the three? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I just... Are they all on? Just turn them all on, yep. They're all on though, aren't they? Flick the switches. Do, do, do the other way for off. Maybe you know, we if did... I do it now, it goes wrong, doesn't it? I, trust me, bro. It's only when you pull the handle this? in it or try it. So is it right to go? Just turn, turn the dials, please. These dials? Yes. I thought... I don't know why, but I thought right was on. You're correct, and for some reason we've changed the... Um, <coughs> changed the way. I don't think there's any order to it, because... Uh, the other valves are just right, left, left, right, left. So that's gone from locked to clear. So you can now get into the mines that way. Oh. All right, but all it does is allow you to go into the mines. It's also part of the puzzle. Yeah. All right, so if you get it wrong, you can't complete that puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that? That is so hard. You get three chances though. Oh yeah, because of the fuses. You, you blow the fuses. Chances. Oh, but then to change the fuse, there's a lot. Yeah. In in Redux, don't we have a little system that keeps putting a fuse there? I'm sure I put. It's like every time you're like, oh, well, you can change the fuses. Oh wait, but it's locked. <laughs> like, every time you might be able to have something redeemed. Like... So we had a question before lunch as well, which we missed. <laughs> so from Whiskers, this is and was an enormous project, let alone for your first game. Did you ever feel that way from making it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we took a couple months off after this game because our, our brain, took like six. Our brains were fried from making it. Um, yeah, it was a massive undertaking for all of us at the time. But yeah, yeah. I think after we released it, that I couldn't look at the concept of making a video game for a good four or five months. How long yeah. was it between release day and <coughs> thinking about the UE4 version? It was at least a few months, wasn't it? A couple it was, well, we, we started thinking about it at the end of summer. Right. Like, towards, oh, sorry, way towards the end of summer. Like, it was August, September. Like August time, yeah. So the game's narrative was, was already formed. When I got involved with it, there was already a really solid idea. I think the through line, to be honest with you, was all made. Um, from the introduction of who the characters were, Ben had had written all of that stuff and fleshed them out and and why they were there. We realized with the way the game had started to adapt that we needed like an intermediate through line that of through certain levels. So my main influence on the narrative with Ether was in form of the ribbons that you collect that get you to one ending of the game. That was the first time I'd ever tried writing anything, to be honest with you, other than there was, and I think the reason I did it because there was like a, a, a story that you could pick up around the game called the Knocker story. And that had seemed to go fairly well. So trusted enough to like come up with some ideas for story. The Knocker story and the ribbons were my first um, real go at learning what an arc is. Dialogue was what I really connected with because I'd tried voice acting in the game and I'd really connected with that and I'd been directing the actors and had started to develop my process of how I direct people. I didn't realize just how differently somebody could deliver the same words and completely edit the feel of something. And this was while I was learning to direct as well because you don't realize when you're an indie game company, you don't realize that that's something that you need. You can't just give an actor a script and expect gold because they have no idea uh, of all of the design conversations you've been in all of the narrative conversations they have a script and they'll interpret that script so a director is their window into whether they understand the game properly whether they understand the direction of each scene and the emotion of it
I played Thomas, character that you eventually figure out that you're playing as. I think I played several kind of announcers and radio people and it was my first first voice acting thing I'd ever done at all. And then Elspeth Edmonds plays Jean and Phyllis in the game. She's absolutely excellent. She'd never been directed before and I'd never directed before and I've learned a lot from working with her about how to direct people because we spent a lot of time on this project together. She actually came and stayed at my flat and she stayed at my flat for like four days just to, to, to record the game. Around the game, there are tapes and answer phone messages from Thomas's son, Jim, and they were by Ben Britton, who's just just fantastic. We, we utilized everybody like the best we could, and I think the game's high quality because of it. And luckily, we've always been praised for, for the voice acting in our game, so it's always something we've tried to expand on. And then on top of that, Almost everybody in the studio at some point um, was took part in singing a song that made up a memory of the game or inserting a line into some speech that happened somewhere just to try and get everybody, one, to make it feel a bit more diverse with characters, also to let everyone have a go and see what it's about and see who's good at it, who wants to do more of it. And so all of Jean's dialogue as well, we tried to make reflect the actions that you were doing in each of the puzzles. So she's like a strike, strike of the back. They're talking about a specific memory, but you're also smashing something down. Oh uh, yeah. So we tried to align Jean's dialogue with the puzzle steps as well. Oh, no, you've got to put it in these. In, in yeah. any of them? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is a blue flame, holy smoky. I remember one of the early save bugs we had was that just like the blue fire just went away when you shut the game off. I've, oh, I just keep thinking of things like if we'd... The first time people wake up in the case, if we'd spawn them downstairs, they would have seen all the downstairs. I feel like because we spawn them facing the board, a lot of people mm. probably don't even bother exploring the downstairs that much. Spawn them in like the bedroom or something yeah. like that downstairs. Yeah, find their way up to the board. Yeah. It is nice to have people start straight away, though, going to yeah. the, um, getting into the game, as opposed to if they started down here, spent That's five, ten minutes going, what am I doing? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we had a lot, I remember we had a lot of, like, I mean, an hour in about just that initial teleport from the case to... Yeah. Because, like, to figure out. there's... We just kept flashing that message on the screen, like, teleport to case, but then, like, once you've done that once, that's it. There's no more press to teleport back to case, really. You do get it in the harbour. You do that's once, genius, don't you? The item system was a right pain because we had like three different classifications, like small, medium and large items. But you also had items that you weren't allowed to put anywhere else. So the only item that was allowed there was the false bottom. So you can't actually physically swap an item there, you have to take the false bottom. Well, he, take a just, of that. he just left the... So that's why there's the item sure. zone on top, so you can put something down. Oh, sorry, I get what you mean. Yeah. So all these locker names are uh, from Idle Thumbs, the podcast. So yeah. Sean V, Sean Vineman, uh, uh, okay, yeah. Firewatch as well. It was a simpler time because in some ways we were naive and we didn't know what we were doing. Looking back, that was actually quite nice because we sort of had smaller problems to solve in some ways. So I sort of look back at what we did and what we accomplished and it's this, lo it's this lovely game that stands upon its own and it's like, ah, I sort of wish we could just, I could just make things like that now. And then maybe, maybe I could, maybe I should, but like, I, I like looking back at what we accomplished, especially with the five or six of us at that, at that level. And I think we really pulled that off. You know, it was quite long days sometimes, you know, you come in and then you'd leave like quite late, get some tea, go to bed, come in the next day. But I think a part of that also wasn't like just a traditional like crunch style mentality so much as back then we didn't necessarily know what we were doing and when you're coming from that point of view it's actually quite difficult to get a good amount of work done in a timely manner when you still have like that level of inexperience and you're coming up against roadblocks that like perhaps we wouldn't necessarily get today as things went on and like you know the project got bigger and then stresses came in from like having to finish and you know financially we weren't exactly um, solid in any way, shape or form. I would get to the studio at 8, I would work until 5, then I'd have to 
run back to the other side of Manchester, cook, eat, come back down because I, <laughs> because I used to teach at FutureWorks just over the road. Uh, and I did that from 7 till 10. So it was like 8 till 5, then 7 till 10. And my walk took an hour there and back. So I, I think I did that for two years and it was really, really tough. If any of us kind of decided to leave, like that put everyone else in just an impossible position. So we kind of just decided, look, we've all, we've all made this decision and we're sticking with it until, it's, until we see it through. And I think we were like, that was, that was probably th the good and brave thing that we all did is that we all kind of stuck to it, even though it was ridiculously hard at points. The only time in my life where I've ever been in debt was making ether. As the game progressed, I was just working from home because we couldn't afford the train fare to come into the studio. I went into a supermarket near me and it was near closing time and the pies had been reduced and there were just loads of pies that hadn't sold that were fresh that day. And the guy was just marking them up for sale and I just said to him like, how, how much are you doing this for? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I said, well, do them as low as you, you're willing to go and I'll take a load off you if you want. And he was like, all right, he, was just, he didn't care. He just marked every single one at 9p and some of them were packs of four pies and some were two and like they were all different types and I think I spent about two pounds 97 at the end all in and got 49 pies um, and I, I bought the pies home put them in the freezer and for the next month I ate pie for breakfast lunch and dinner literally I, I spent a month eating pies that's all I ate just to try and survive and get the game finished I think Pete and James were both working at UCLan and FutureWorks and they were spending that the money that they were earning on the studio and getting and even at one point Pete was paying my rent towards the back end of it because we were making zero money like there wasn't a product to sell there wasn't a game to play it was being made and it was uh, you know carry on making it or just call it all quits and it was all for nothing oh, in the, uh, I remember this this creaks oh that does not you before and here Oh, it does it? Yeah. Do you know what that sound is? Take a listen, tell me if you know what it is. Really. The breathing? No, no the creaking. The bottle. Oh. It's a string of a guitar or something. Um, that you'd... It was our microwave door. Oh. <laughs> mum used to do lunches there, it was our microwave door. <laughs> Didn't the victory shaft, as you walk under that, doesn't that creak as well? Obviously. Yeah, that's the, that's the microwave door pitched down a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there are like five sources of sound to this whole game. The industrial area? On the PS4 version of the game? Um, or like at least the Redux version? It, it runs better than any other level on here. And that's because basically for, for ages, like we were having really bad frame rate on this level for some reason. And we didn't really understand why, like back then we didn't really know how to deal with any performance issues or do anything. So we kind of went crazy and started like optimizing everything we could possibly see um, really well. And like the game still wasn't running good enough and still wasn't running good enough. And we were gaining little bits. So at one point I just like started deleting whole sections of a level to see if it would start running again in case there was like a rogue actor and in the end it was just like the reflections of the water were being captured every frame <laughs> and that literally made the game run like it's really good, bad it's good that you but, like overhauled all the assets but the thing is that we <laughs> yeah we optimized it so much that the in the game like most levels run at like i don't know like 50 60 frames a second you get to hear it runs at 120 <laughs> smooth as hell now <laughs> Oh, it it dupes you. I remember. I remember all of this. You can destroy them as you go, I believe. You need the lamp out. Dude, doing this was so hard. Look how many... We spent so long doing that in matinee. It actually looks good, though. It does, yeah. It still holds up. We would like financially. We were in such a such a dire place. Like we, basically, like we just didn't we just didn't pay ourselves or anything throughout the entirety of the project. When we did get a grant, we used it to like get Dave on the team and like hire a programmer basically and and make sure that we could pay him. <laughs> uh, and even then, after that ran out, like Dave also just took it on him and it was like, hey, the project's cool. I want to see it through as well. Like, which is incredible for him because he just came in through this sort of grant that we managed to get.
We very much bootstrapped the entire V for One. We uh, spent £37,000 on the entire development. And that was over the course of four, four or five years. I mean, to put that into perspective, we probably spent that in a month now at the studio just developing. So like something that we spent four and a half years of our life on, we're now doing that on a monthly basis at the studio. That's a, almost like a big reflection in itself, just understanding like the scope and what you need to do. But yeah, there was never any larger ambition than to just uh, build this one game. We weren't trying to build a larger studio or had any larger ambition in mind. It's just this one thing that we wanted to put out into the world.